The immediate result of dictator Hitler's reoccupation of the Rhineland is a series of conversations between the Locarno powers. Mr. Maisky, the Soviet ambassador, leaves the foreign office, while in Downing Street the special cabinet meeting comes to an end, and most ministers leave in earnest conversation, Mr. J. H. Thomas and Mr. Walter Runciman, Lord Hailsham, the Lord Chancellor, and Sir Philip Cunliffe Lister, Secretary for Air. Sir John Simon, the Home Secretary, and Mr. Oliver Stanley, President of the Board of Education. And as ministers leave, Mr. Attlee, the leader of the opposition, calls for a conference with the Prime Minister. And then Mr. Eden goes across to the House of Commons to make his statement. And now all eyes are on Geneva, where the nations will pass judgment on Germany's action. As the cream-coloured, red-nosed monoplane which won the King's Cup hits the tarmac at Croydon Aerodrome, it brings Flight Lieutenant Tommy Rose back to England, and one more historic flight has come to an end. He has flown from London to Cape Town and back solo, and has beaten the record both ways. On the outward journey, he covered the distance in less than four days, lowering the record set by Amy Mollison by over 13 hours. And on the return journey, though he was seriously delayed by bad weather, adverse winds, and even a political misunderstanding, he completed the journey in just over six days, and beat the previous record by over five hours. So now it's safe to say that Tommy rose to the occasion. From Croydon, Flight Lieutenant Rose goes straight to the Mansion House, where he presents a message of greeting to the Lord Mayor of London from the Mayor of Johannesburg. And once again, goodwill within the Empire has been borne on the wings of the air. Well done, Tommy Rose. London hears the tramp of marching feet and the beat of the drum as the guards march from Chelsea Barracks to Waterloo Station. farewells are always sweet. Let's have a long one. Let's have a quick one. It may seem sad leaving the old country just when the football pools war is getting exciting, but after all there are many worse places than Egypt, and as far as weather goes Britain is one of them. So while we're pulling the icicles off the ends of our noses and emptying the water out of our collars, they'll be basking in the finest climate in the world and bathing in the blue Mediterranean waters. No wonder they're cheering. Viscountess Craig Avon, wife of the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, honours Belfast shipbuilding by performing the launching ceremony of the Royal Ulsterman. This 3,000-ton motor vessel has been built for the service between Scotland and Ireland, and she'll set a new high standard in comfortable travel across the often stormy waters of the North Channel. So here's good luck and long service to the Royal Ulsterman. And may she carry not only passengers but goodwill between the nations of Scotland and Northern Ireland. If you happen to be one of those people who were washed out of house and home by the recent floods, these pictures from America should make you feel that compared with them you're having a good time. Everywhere the ice jams are breaking up in the spring thaw. And though it's very nice for the youngsters, the melting ice is creating a threat which even dynamite cannot destroy. For with the jams broken, billions of tons of floating ice move down in a menacing march of destruction. And soon we shall be hearing more and more of the toll of raging torrents, the tragedy of flood, the bursting of dikes, the resistless surge of waters. In the Tennessee Valley, this bridge has become unsafe, and now army engineers are blowing it up.
In America, nature is in fierce mood. There's something unusual in the way of launches on the Tyne when two new destroyers of the 1934 Naval Construction Program take the water within 10 minutes of each other. It might have been more spectacular if they'd sent them down together, but as there's only a few feet between them on the slips, it wouldn't have been quite so good for the destroyers. So the hero takes the water first, and then the Hereward is named by the wife of Sir Hereward Wake, the modern descendant of the famous English warrior, and that's two more new ships to take their place in the Royal Navy.